Beautiful. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. It's wonderful to be kicking off our celebration for Black History Month 20, 2016. I want to, yeah. I want to thank the city of Vancouver for allowing us to have this formal proceeding for the fifth year in a row. My name is Vanessa Richards, and it's my pleasure to be your host for these proceedings. I am a member of the community planning committee that has been designing these proceedings for the last five years. And I'm wondering if my colleagues are in the house, if you want to just stand up and say, hey, wave your hands. Are some of our members in the house right now? Are they out in the, out in the field working? Yeah, beautiful, great. <laughs> nice, thank you so much. Job well done, as ever. I want to thank Kurai Mbaiwa and Yoro Nukosi for providing that wonderful music that got us started. We'll be hearing more from them as we carry on in just a few minutes. And uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we're here on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, unceded territories. They never gave them up. Glad to be here. So every year, as we begin our proceedings for this event, I think I've said that word maybe six times already, and it's not even in my script. I guess it makes me feel officious. <gasps> Go off script. Um, but every year, our committee talks about what does it mean to design a Black History Month? What is the purpose? How do we acknowledge the history of African people here? In, in the diaspora, in Vancouver, and, in glo and globally. And how is it relevant? Why is it relevant? Why is it just one month? The shortest month. And does a focus on the construct of race, does that build bridges? Or does it help divide? We, we talk about what is black culture? And how does culture Mary to race. So we're a very thoughtful group. We, 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 we endeavor to generate a truthful and a beautiful container to acknowledge the uniqueness of our black community and culture here in Metro Vancouver, both historically and contemporarily. We try to relate ourselves in context to the wider world. We try to do this all in 45 minutes. So I, I've come to think of Black History Month something like a birthday party. A birthday party for a person, a people's whom you love. And just like at a birthday party, this is a time when you say, oh, I love you, you're looking great. I got your back. What do you need? How can I celebrate you? And I think it's an important way as we and the rest of the world moves through really important and complex conversations about race and culture and constructs of whiteness that when we take a time for Black History Month, we just treat it like a party sometimes and say, I love you, I got your back, rock on. And that's what we're going to do today. So, and one of the important things that we learned about, one of the lessons that we can all take from the report and process on truth and reconciliation is that a people are not simply their skin tone. They are their culture. Part of what we're doing here in Vancouver, where we have many bloodlines married together and blending of many cultures, we're, we're, we're maintaining the tradition of hailing our ancestors, hailing our elders, witnessing our achievements, and calling for the ongoing transformation required to create a world that works for all of us. And this ongoing mix of blended ideas and peoples have been the history of the world. That's the history of the world. That's how we started. That's how we got from one place to the next. And Black History Month is embedded in the civil rights movement. And throughout it, we are connected to all struggles for justice and equality. So today, as we honor the achievements of Dr. Asante, originally from Ghana, we are thrilled to present to you a small nod to the Pan-African presence in Vancouver. So... With that in mind, let us take another piece of 
music. Um, Korai and Yoro, if you wanted to come back and play a couple of pieces for us, please. We have Korai, who's originally from Zimbabwe. He began playing music when he was at the age of six, playing mbira and drums in traditional ceremonies and village gatherings, perhaps not unlike this, a gathering of esteemed and beautiful people. And he's been in Vancouver with us since 2002, and he's teaching mbira and singing drum workshops across Vancouver and North America, taking his music to festivals including WOMAD and ZimFest and Montreal Jazz Fest. Let me tell you a bit about Euro. Just take a look at that beautiful face there. He's been with us for some time now, originally from Benin. And he has a Waba music studio, recording artists in the house, keep it in mind. And today, Korai and Euro will be performing the songs Chifarai, meaning happy days, and Tariva, we used to say, playing the marimba, the djembe, and the talking drum, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, Korai. Thank you, Yoro. So next time you see a band called Zimba Moto, next time you see a band called Zimba Moto, that's when a Korai's band, you know to go. Next time you see a band called Zambai Trio, that's Korai, you know to go. Perfect. Well, now it is my great pleasure to welcome our mayor, Gregor Robertson, to read the official proclamation proclaiming February as Black History Month in our city. Please. Take it away. Welcome, everybody. Happy Black History Month, almost. We're getting an early start on it, and uh, I'm really, really happy to see everybody here the biggest crowd ever in this council chamber, I think. Safe to say. Uh, first, let me, um, let me uh, give thanks and acknowledgement. We are on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and very thankful 
for that always. And very thankful to have uh, our staff make extra space and seats and have everyone fit in here. Uh, this is one of the highlights of the year here at City Hall celebrating Black History Month. And, and really that's thanks to the amazing people who make this happen year after year, make it possible for us to celebrate in here and make sure that um, we have a good time doing it. So a big thanks. Yeah. Let me just uh, acknowledge the community members who, are, who work with our city staff to make this happen. Uh, this year's team that pulled that together, if you would stand tall, Constance Barnes, Mimi Bayane. Keep standing, keep standing. All of you stay up. Barb Chirinos. Yeah. Selwyn Jacobs. Vanessa Richards. And Dr. Handel Wright. A big hand for everyone. Thank you all so much uh, for your great work to make this all happen on the day today. Thanks, uh, you can relax now. <laughs> and uh, I, I need to introduce members of uh, council, the elected folks who were here representing the citizens of Vancouver. Our Deputy Mayor, Heather Ball. <laughs> Heather Deal. Where's Elizabeth? <laughs> I shouldn't have looked down at the paper in front of me. And Elizabeth Ball, is she? She's not even here after all that. <laughs> Raymond Louie is here next to Heather. Raymond is Councillor Tim Stevenson. Thanks, Tim. Councillor Adrian Carr. Councillor Jeff Meggs. And we have from our park board, Catherine Evans, park board trustee. Okay, so that's the uh, elected team uh, here to represent. Thanks for being here. And I just want to acknowledge uh, how important this day is. Black History Month is a big thing in Vancouver. Thanks to all of you who uh, make it real, make it live. And we're, uh, we're just thankful to be able to celebrate this kick it off here at City Hall uh, for these years and I want to uh, we're going to get into the details and the nitty-gritty and celebrate uh, some great people and do a little stamp thing like we always do but I want to there's two things I want to talk about just briefly about black future from local to global just very quickly we, we made a big decision here at council uh, some weeks ago about taking down the Georgia viaducts, uh, Georgia and Dunsmuir viaducts, which uh, obliterated Hogan's Alley. And the, the downfall of those viaducts means that there can be a, an uprising happen in a neighborhood that used to be the heart of the black community here in Vancouver. And we're looking forward to that. <laughs> so we... We got lots of work to do to figure out exactly what that looks like on the ground, how it all, uh, all that all manifests. Lots of work to do in the community to figure that out. It's going to be a big change in that part of the city, and uh, it needs to reflect the history and be all about uh, a brighter future for the for community. So, the other piece of, of future that I, I want to mention because it's been it's sort of lodged in me for some time now since being in um, in Paris at the climate summit. And there was, I was with lots of uh, mayors from cities in Africa. And there's this incredibly powerful new uh, vision of the future that's emerging as the, the big cities in Africa, who for the most part have not been overrun like Europe, North America, and Asia by industrial progress. Uh, those cities uh, so far have for the most part escaped being completely um, uh, toxified by by heavy industry and what's emerging now is the opportunity that all of these capital cities and big cities across Africa are going to leapfrog the big cities around the rest of the world and they're going to go right to the digital age just like cell phones have done in, in many parts of the developing world they're going to be the cleanest greenest most modern technological cities of the world over these next couple decades because they're skipping all the in industry that has pounded on so many cities as, um, as the world has industrialized. And as we go into the greening of the world and the new economy that's being built, 
it's the African capitals that that may stand to gain the most and be the most uh, advanced cities on this planet, which would be an amazing piece of economic and environmental and social justice. So, so anyway, just uh, wanted to share that uh, from a city perspective. And now we're going to talk about uh, someone uh, who has been an extraordinary human being, a member of the community here. Uh, we have a tradition of recognizing the outstanding accomplishments of local community members when we celebrate Black History Month here. And this year, I am very pleased to recognize Dr. Kojo Ohene Asante, who is with us today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you um, about uh, Dr. Asante, and then he's going to come up to be recognized and share some words. Dr. Asante was born in Ghana, West Africa. He obtained his school and early college education in Ghana before winning a scholarship that brought him to Canada to go to UBC. And before uh, returning to Ghana, Dr. Asante wanted to experience life in northern Canada. And he went for what was intended to be a two-year stay in Terrace, BC, with his wife and two daughters. And as the first and only pediatrician in northwestern British Columbia, his practice soon stretched from Terrace all the way north to include the whole of the Yukon as well. He, he realized that there was a dire need for services for children in the north, and he ended up staying for 20 years. And in that time, he established child development centers in Terrace, in Kitimat, and in Whitehorse. And it was during the early part of his northern stay that Dr. Asante became aware of the problems caused by drinking alcohol uh, and the impact uh, during pregnancy. He saw fetal alcohol syndrome as a preventable disorder and he has worked to educate the public and professional colleagues about uh, the need to prevent this disorder and the support that's required for individuals and families. Really groundbreaking work across uh, the north of Canada. In 2000, the Asante Center for Fetal Alcohol Syndrome was opened in Maple Ridge, and this uh, multidisciplinary facility has played a significant role in diagnosing kids and youth with fetal alcohol syndrome and other neurodevelopmental problems. And the center's dedicated staff have been very active in research and education and government policy development. Uh, huge uh, breakthroughs on all those departments. Uh, when you think about where that was uh, just a num handful of years ago. He has been a powerful force as a health advocate and a role model. I'm very pleased to uh, recognize Dr. Asante for his career spent in service of communities across the province of BC, but helping out communities really all over the world, helping people with fetal alcohol syndrome in particular, that disorder, and all their families and friends, all the people that that touches. So uh, it's an extraordinary body of work, and we're going to recognize Dr. Asante. I am going to read the, plaque, the official proclamation, which is, ties all of this together, Black History Month, and Dr. Asante. Whereas on a global level, the General Assembly of the United Nations has named 2010 to 2020 as the decade of the African diaspora. That is this decade, and we're right in the middle of it. How's it going so far? Yeah. Okay, and the African Union and the Euro European Union have identified 2010 to 2020 as the decade of African women. Yeah. We're doing all right with that? Okay. <laughs> and whereas people of African descent have been part of Canada since 1605, and British Columbia since 1858, and have contributed to the vibrant cultural, economic, political, and social development of the province. And whereas we gather in council chambers today to recognize the achievements of those who have refused to accept second class status and help shape the present in which many voices are heard celebrating the people and culture that make the community so strong. And whereas, Dr. Kojo Ohene Asante has dedicated his career to improving the health and wellness of others as an advocate for those who have fetal alcohol syndrome. And whereas born in Ghana, Dr. Kojo Ohene, Ohene Asante came to Vancouver to attend UBC, has spent his career building support services for people with FAS by training medical professionals in countries around the world and founding the nonprofit Asante Center, which helps people across Metro Vancouver. 
And whereas Dr. Kojo Ohene Asante is a pioneer in the diagnosis and treatment of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and has received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, as well as the Governor General's Meritorious Service Medal of Canada for his innovative work. And whereas people in the city of Vancouver celebrate Black History Month by recognizing the many cultural, economic, and political contributions of people of African heritage and new Canadians from the African diaspora, now therefore I, Gregor Robertson, the Mayor of the City of Vancouver, do hereby proclaim February 2016 as Black History Month in the City of Vancouver. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Asante. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, for reading the proclamation. Uh, I'm honored to accept the recognition of the Black History Month for this year. I, I, was, I was told to say a few words, not for more than five minutes. <laughs> it is quite auspicious that for such an important occasion, I've been elected to represent a lot of people. I represent all of you, black and white, and at the, start, at the same time that I start, I must say that I recognize the, that we are on the, on the land of the Coast Salish people, which we should not forget any more than we should forget when we are in different countries, different territories, in Africa, in Scotland, or in other places that we visit or work. I would like to thank the committee which decided to honor me and the work of the team that I work with. We have no doubt gone a long way during the time that we've been working together, but it's been a long time before all these things started, and I'm sure it was not an easy decision by the committee to decide who should win or who should be recognized for today. There are many worthy people from the African diaspora in the Vancouver area. I'm sure that I'm only one of these people, and I'm very grateful that the committee chose me. Mr. Paul Hendren and his coordination work, the committee in deciding who should take this opportunity uh, to talk to the people assembled here, and the people who have traveled to come and participate in this occasion. Actually, who are supposed to travel uh, and not be here now. So my dear wife tried to keep this away from me, <laughs> but because of the need, that need of traveling and the reason why we are not traveling, she had to let me know in advance. <laughs> to our friends, family, the city council and the company here, I will direct a few remarks to the theme of this event building healthy diasporic African communities. I choose to understand the theme in the context of the active participation of the African diaspora 
in the broad communities we live in and not as an isolated diasporic ghetto which ultimately uh, is not healthy communities. In spite of the immensity of the size of the continent of Africa and the diversity of the cultural, linguistic, religious and other differences, we have been proud to identify ourselves as the daughters and sons of Mother Africa. Healthy diasporic communities have, however, implied our willingness and our ability to recognize our strengths and teach our offspring about the history of Africa, our songs, our heroes, and other qualities that unite us, rather than the religious animosities, for example, the Christian versus Muslim, or the tribal wars which have waged on for years in our villages far away. We need to form alliances with other diasporan people from various parts of the world, the West Indies, there are black people all over the world. Our achievements should be sung. We should encourage our children and our grandchildren to be aware of the history in a world which is dominated by the Western or Eurocentric view of what is right, what is history, and what is art, or what is important in this world of ours. <laughs> Indeed, it was the early part, during the early part of the century that a group of few uh, students in France, uh, including Mr. Sengo of uh, uh, Senegal, uh, with his friends from Martinique and from Guyana, who experienced discrimination and the thought by the French uh, universities that they attended that their culture was not of value and it was out of this that they brought up the concept of negritude. The concept implied that Africa had its own values, that African values were no less important than the values of France or Britain or other countries. And I think you agree with me that the French are still having difficulty getting over this. They are their, uh, their place in the world and their feeling that other people's cultures are not nearly as important as the French culture. Although not always recognized by the dominant society, and some facts of history and achievements are intentionally suppressed when they are performed by people of the African diaspora. Although there have been significant contributions of people of African origins to British Columbia and to Canada in many areas, including education, sports, medicine, the arts and sciences, they have served in the military, in commerce and transportation. Music and acting are important areas that they have excelled in spite of the negative Oscars which are at present important <laughs> coming on. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, apart from a few examples in British Columbia history, such as the role of Sir James Douglas, the first governor of BC, whose mother had uh, antecedents in the West Indies, 
Harry Jerome, the Olympic gold medalist in running. MP Rosemary Brown. MP Lincoln Alexander. And a few other people. We have not represented ourselves much in the political arena. We have not been much uh, in, uh, in evidence when we come to the city council in Vancouver, for example. For some reason, we have not formed alliances with other people. I know that our numbers are small and that voting as a bloc is not going to be the way to go. However, there is no reason why we do not form alliances with other people and by our dint of enterprise, they're showing that we are interested in politics, that we are equally challenge, uh, we are equal to the challenges before us. There is no reason why Africans uh, or people of African origin should not be elected to represent the people of Vancouver in City Hall. Mm. There are many people who work hard for our, our city, for our province, for our country. I can say that the black people or the people of the African diaspora have contributed their fair share in this respect. Let us continue to be part of the whole. Let us not stay in uh, uh, ghettos. If uh, some time ago, as the mayor was saying, by the place of the, in, in a lower, low, uh, yeah, Hogan Valley was the place where Africans resided, or black people resided. And this place was torn down following a report which I became aware of uh, some time ago. I think we are lucky in some ways that we did not isolate ourselves in ghettos, but participate fully in the activities of the general public and our citizens of the first order in Vancouver and in Canada. Yes. Please join me all in thanking Vancouver and thanking the city for welcoming us into the First Nations for allowing us to remain in their territory. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Asante. I raise my hands to you. When you said, when you started to talk about African heroes, I, I thought you were going to say African hair, which is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Not to diminish the gravitas of what we've just been discussing, but you may like to know we are having a black hair, Afro hair savoir faire event this year. So anybody that wants to talk about maintaining, styling, and Falling in love with your black Afro hair, February 20th at the um, Granville Island as part of the Black History Month, the Winterruption. We've got a Facebook group, and I especially I got to be frank about this. Anybody that has a black child and doesn't have Afro hair, and you kind of wondered how you're going to get through that, this is your invitation. <laughs> so feel free to invite all your friends with black children. Yeah, we'll have live demonstrations, films, and everything. Barbara on the committee and I have been a. <laughs> thinking about this important work. And, you know, we laugh, but it is important because it's about self-image. It's about self-care. It's about feeling beautiful in the world. It's like feeling like your hair matters. And you've got, I remember one time I had, I went down, to, I had to travel all the way to Army and Navy from Burnaby to get um, Afro Sheen, <laughs> blue Afro Sheen. And one time, a few times it wasn't there and I stood I cried, I cried, right? I like touched my hair and looking, thinking, well, oh my gosh. But anyway, so one of the things we're gonna do is also have resources there for folks. So that said, 
I want to um, invite, speaking of our Pan-Africanism here, we're going to invite Veronica, Veronica up. Let me get her long, beautiful name, Veronica Finn Brewey. She studied internationally in Ghana, the United Kingdom, Australia, South Africa, and at UBC as well. She holds degrees in a number of disciplines, including law, public health, refugee studies, and science. What's really interesting about her interdisciplinary learning exchanges is that she's been doing research and consulting in these areas in over 20 countries. Her experience has had her working in British Columbia with the, our government's Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, Migration Health Department, the International Organization for Migration in Geneva. She's been working as an adjunct professor at UBC and with the Center for Policy in Liberia. Speaking of black history, one of our great achievements. She's also the founder and editor of the chief, editor in chief of the Journal of Internal Displacement. It, this is the only scholastic platform dedicated to the plight of globally internally displaced persons. So her own life includes being a child survivor of the Liberian Civil War. She's been an internally displaced person and a single, single immigrant to Canada. We think about families, we spend a lot of time making sure we can keep families together and the courage it takes for a singular person young person to travel to a new world in a new country is, again, deep courage. And these experiences have fueled her passion for helping marginalized populations, especially women and children caught in conflicts. And we're going to invite Veronica to come share some words with us right now. If you would please make a warm welcome for Veronica Free Bruhi. Thank you. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. <laughs> okay, to, to focus my attention and not because what she just read, actually my life is, you know, a book. So five minutes, it's always very difficult to squeeze in, but I, I wrote things down so that I can stay focused and just, if I keep my head down, sorry, but I just really need to read off the paper. So um, when I was a child, I would come home from school with all sorts of homework to do. But in particular, I will ask my dad to help me with my math homework. And while sitting around the jack-o'-lantern, I'm sure many people know what jack-o'-lantern is, uh, made of carnation thin, tin, and uh, a dirty rope that we would pick from anywhere, we'd stick it in there, bore a hole through the, the tin, and put some kerosene in there. My dad would say to me, the heights that great men reach and attain, or the heights that great men reach and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, were, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. When I grew up, I will, I will later on find out that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow actually quoted that. As a child, I had not the slightest clue what this quotation meant. I was happy all along to just be taught by my father. Even when I was around, sorry, I just missed a point. I was happy to be learning and taught by my daddy, even when all around us were pitch dark or we tried to have several occasions before the lantern would go off. Okay. Um, well, dad didn't survive, so he's not around to be able to appreciate some of the hard investment he did into me, but I am grateful to him today. Sometimes when I listen to an introduction of me like Vanessa just read, I'm still amazed as to how I actually arrived here. Trust me, the height that Veronica has actually maintained and kept was not actually the sudden flight. From sleepy from sleeping on a very hard wood cardboard with a piece of cloth because my mom could never afford to buy a, a mattress to actually um, lying on a spring uh, bunk bed that she got from her friend that was actually very rusted to living in a house made of mud that was infested with termites uh, and you know what I mean when you have to share a house with termites. That means all the wood on the house is constantly broken down. And so in the end, we actually lost that house. 
to having cheekers. I don't, I don't know whether people know what cheekers is, but if you don't have your foot, you know, the floor of your house paved, you have to live off the ground. And so these inserts, actually, they're arachnids. They, they get the bore into your leg, and then you have to pick them up and each a lot. So I grew up with a lot of cheekers in my toe. <laughs> um, and as if all of this weren't enough, then we had the Civil War in Liberia in 1989. So having survived three years of the brutal years in Liberia with no access to food, no access to education, basically nothing, um, and where my mom actually became con uh, infested with tuberculosis, so then I had to become the breadwinner of our family at the tender age of 13. So um, we then found ourselves on the deck of the Ghanaian peacekeeping vessel that were going to Ghana that I finally made it up to Ghana to become a refugee. So nine years of my life were spent in Ghana living as a refugee. Um, can I have some of the water down here? So being a refugee in Ghana came with its own problems. I mean, spending sleepless nights in a mosquito-infested classroom with low-grade tungsten lights and eating uh, a dry gari. Professor <laughs> Dr. Asante would know what a dry gari and sugar is <laughs> for many nights with nothing. Um, and compare that, it's actually those experiences are nothing compared to the amount of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that I endured for nine years that I spent in Ghana. So in spite of all these, I remember telling myself that I didn't care what the experiences were going to be in Ghana. I was going to stay in the house, and I was going to graduate from the University of Ghana. And I did. Actually, I left the house just six, five months after I actually finished my studies in July 2000 from the University of Ghana. So the deep inner strength and resilience and persistence actually stem from words of my mother. She always said to me, take your education very seriously, a typical African mother. Don't end up, with, don't end up like me, and that means my mom had eight children out of two marriage and later on had to raise us by herself. And don't follow boys because they will just impregnate you and they will leave you to take care of the children by yourself. <laughs> So that was the story of my mother's life, and she tried as much as possible to pass that on to me so that I don't continue. Sure enough, I stayed, like I said, I stayed with my garden, knowing that I had uh, a feat to, to, to someone to be able to graduate from the University of Ghana. And I did graduate from the University of Ghana in February 2001, and by August 22nd, 2001, I arrived in British Columbia to study at UBC for my second bachelor degree on the World University Service of Canada Refugee Sponsor Program. So at UBC, UBC student, each of UBC students donate $1 for me for my tuition and my food and my accommodation to be taken care of. So at UBC and in Canada, my experience in vulnerability actually metamorphosized into a complete systematic violence Unlike the personal and physical and interpersonal violence I was experiencing in Canada, it turned into a systematic form of uh, violence. And that is at the center stage of that is discrimination and racism. I never realized that I was so black. I never realized that I was really African and so refugee until I arrived in Canada. But quitting was never part of my vocabulary. My philosophy in life was, like, I believe that life is very vertical. And when I was in Ghana, I had the opportunity to clean people's toilets and their bathroom and sweep their floor. There was no way I was going to come to Canada and do the same thing. So I just made a, <laughs> a promise to myself that coming to Canada meant I did not need to clean people's toilets and wash dishes in McDonald's, and I didn't do that. So that was a personal choice, and not in all respect to my immigrant, my fellow immigrants, friends, and family who come, and I are so forced into that kind of uh, uh, servitude, but personally, I just made a choice that I wasn't going to do that.
So at this junction, I hope by now you, you can clearly see the social determinants of health and well-being that I play in my life, the intersection of race, gender, social class, and uh, social status, predetermining the outcomes in my life. And yeah, when I say health, I actually mean World Health Organization definition of health, meaning not just merely the absence of disease, but a complete physical, social, uh, physical, um, spiritual, and mental well-being. So being a poor black African, I'm almost there, <laughs> being a poor black African refugee with no family support predisposed me to a lot of risk and violence. Notwithstanding, a tiny window of opportunity, precisely an educational window of opportunity, was extended to me. So my full potential was maximized, supported with an intrinsic value. So it's been 23 years now since I parted from my, from my family. Interestingly, the assumption, and I think Vanessa already alluded to it, people say, oh, where well, you have your family, so mother, father, but you know, in Canada, people usually say, where is your family? Where is it? Well, some of us just came here by ourselves. So when we are leaving, we pack all our bags and we leave. <laughs> so, well, to say the least, don't be fooled or I shouldn't lie to you. I did not do all this by myself. Uh, life experiences has taught me that your family do not necessarily mean bloodline family members. Because so many wonderful people, and some of which are here, uh, uh, stood by me through thick and thin. I was able to pursue my dreams and arrive to where I am. So, Shireen and Daniel Theophilus, I'd like to say thank you to you. These are my adopted Canadian family. I met them the second day I arrived in Canada, and since then, they've always been in my life. I really appreciate you. You mean everything to me. Thank you so much for being here for me. To Kara and Tucker Christensen, thank you for being mentors. Thank you for standing by me. Thank you for making me to understand that black people can be professors in British Columbia. <laughs> And they can do wonderful things. And of course, to my husband, I love you. <laughs> thank you for being the best man ever in my life. And thanks to Vanessa, thanks to Paul, thanks to the mayor, thanks to the wonderful people who invited me to be part of this ceremony. I really appreciate it. And it was an honor to be given a podium to speak. Thank you. I want to congratulate you, Veronica, on your achievements. I raise my hands to you. You know, the committee, we really wanted to talk about health, and we were so pleased when we wanted to talk about a number of things, but as we distilled it into the idea of health and well-being and really looking at the African diaspora, and when we talked about Black History Month, it didn't, we could expand it beyond um, a West African or Caribbean or an African American presentation. And so I'm so happy the comments that you've made about health and well-being and and your hair looks great. <laughs> now, one of our other fabulous hairstyles in the room, who's doing big work in the world, we've got this curious tradition of unveiling Black History Month stamps, which is a great opportunity to write letters to people you love. Um, maybe they're down the street, maybe they're in another country, uh, across the city. But this is a beautiful opportunity to uh, show and represent. Maurice Earl, would you please um, join us, please, from um, Canada Post, this beautiful family. Thank you, Maurice. And Mayor Robertson, would you please? Have I got this right? Yeah, no, we're good. This is exactly right. This is exactly right. Thank you, Maurice. Hello, family. How are you doing? How's my hair? You all know me for quite some time, for many years, and uh, you probably saw the 
the graduation from nothing to this. <laughs> oh, no, 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 my friend, no. You have to come the 20th. <laughs> now, how do you follow up all of that? I don't know. Fantastic speeches by everybody. Um, touching on so many different aspects. Um, and I'm going to touch on one, actually, that Mr. Asante talked about. Um, yes, every year, Canada Post puts out these uh, Canada, uh, what's it, Black History Month stamps, sometimes one or sometimes two. This year, I'm very pleased. It's usually myself or my lovely wife and my little boy there that's here. Um, but we're pleased to be here, you know, as part of Canada Post you know, on behalf. So the stamp program that we have uh, tells Canada's story through its achievers, its milestones, its unique features, and its communities. The stamp honors men who step forward, okay, to serve this country, this stamp right here, um, in uniform. And this touches me personally as well because I was one of those guys. Yes, short hair. <laughs> Many years ago. Um, you know, in uniform, but they were denied the opportunity to fight. So yet they prevailed over prejudice and won the, the right to go overseas. Uh, in 1914, the First World War broke out. Men volunteered by the tens of thousands. Uh, but when black Canadians tried to enlist, they were usually told that they could not join unless they had permission from their local regiment's uh, commanding officer. And that permission was rarely given. During the war, black Canadians kept pushing for the right to serve. Finally, in July 1916, their persistence paid off. The government formed the number two construction battalion, okay? Which began to recruit black Canadians from across the country, many from Ontario. Now, 100 years later, Canada Post is honoring this battalion. The stamp uses uh, archival photographs and illustrations to tell the story, which you'll see in a little bit. You'll see the actual faces of some of the members of the unit. Uh, you'll see men going to work in the forest with their tools on their shoulders. The battalion felled trees in the mountainous region of France. They milled the timbers into lumber for the trenches, encampments, and the railways in the front line. They worked 10 hours a day, six days a week in harsh conditions. Most of the members of the battalion never saw combat. Some found ways to join combat units. In fact, there were estimated 2,000 black Canadians who served in the front lines of that war. The men of the battalion helped pave the way for later generations of black men and women in our armed forces. When the Second World War became, or came, uh, in 1939, black Canadians could freely enlist in regular units in the Canadian Army. With this stamp, we honor the brave, loyal, and determined men of the number two construction battalion. These men helped shape modern day Canada. I would like to invite Mayor Robertson up and join me to unveil this stamp. Thank you very much. Vanessa? I'm really very impressed with the design of that stamp. It looks fantastic, Maurice. Job well done. So I expect a lot of love letters and letters of thanks and gratitude going out with that stamp on it, keeping our posties in good work. Um, is this the image that's going to be on the famous cupcakes? 
Wow. So we will have edible stamps for you this afternoon as well, too. I know it's getting close to dinner time, so you can enjoy those at our reception, which is almost, we're almost in the eating part of the evening, which includes eating stamps on cupcakes. Completely edible. Really, really delicious and invigorating. And uh, we're also going to have some really beautiful food for you, Ethiopian, Ethiopian food from Nayela in the lobby. And in the lobby as well, I know, exciting, we'll have uh, traditional Eritrean folk music played by a young lad called Shewet Kadani. He's going to be playing an instrument called the Karar. And speaking of young people, I just want everybody, I hope these kids won't feel self-conscious as I turn around and look at them. How good does that look? Like children at the seat of power? <laughs> yeah, very good. Keep it in mind. We look forward to that, you assuming your position. But actually, I read something recently. It said, you know, we always ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? And one of the questions we can ask them is, what do you want to do right now? So I applaud you assuming your seat there, folks. Very good, very good indeed. I think this takes us, yeah, this is it. We're done, it's time for food. Oh no, we're not done. Oh, surprise, surprise. So speaking of freedom and fighting and warriors and health and well-being, we're gonna, have, we're gonna close out our, our event here in the chamber before we go and enjoy the food with a very, very collaborative, performance from two of our city's most celebrated choirs. We have the pleasure of hearing members of the City Soul Choir and the Marcus Mosley Chorale with Brian Tate on keyboard and Marcus Mosley will be conducting. Now Brian Tate, you want to come on to this keyboard as I continue the introduction? Okay, that sounds good. So, um, perfect, yeah, it's coming in nicely. One of the things um, you need to know that these choirs have come together that tomorrow, January 30th, they're doing a concert called State on Freedom. So this is the song called State on Freedom. Tomorrow's concert is a concert called State on Freedom. It's at St. Andrew's United Church downtown. The tickets are online or at the door. Now this is important too because they're raising money for the St. Andrew Wesley's United Church's refugee sponsorship program. And as we continue to talk about welcoming new Canadians into Canada, and we hear very much about the Syrians, which is, of course, top of mind for most of us, I invite us, in any way you feel casual and untriggered by, to just keep the Africans in the conversation too, because we have a lot of people that need our hospitality right now. And I am um, really excited about Canada growing and expanding in these beautiful ways. What else do we need? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the choir as they perform Stayed on Freedom. And everybody, your participation is encouraged. church right now. Can I get an amen from everybody? Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Yes, I did now. Stayed on freedom. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay 
ain't on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 You can do this, can't you? You ready? Here we go. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. You know, I woke up this morning with my mind and it was You know I'm working and praying with my mind stayed on it. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. Singing and praying with my mind stayed on freedom. You know I'm working and praying with my mind stayed on freedom. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Uh, ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on it. Yeah, yeah. It ain't no harm to keep your mind uh, stayed on it. You know there's no harm to keep your mind stayed on freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on it. You know it. Stayed on. Yeah, yeah. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Come on now. Stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Stayed on freedom. Hall Hallelujah. 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 We're gonna repeat that. One more time. Hallelujah. Here we go. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let's take a little bow. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Who gets this? Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> City Soul and Marcus Corral. Marcus Mosley Corral. There. So. Do we hang out or just? No. Nope. What we're going to do now is now we can have <laughs> For the event, right? So these are our first, these are first day couples. It has the stamp, but you can see when like this. Are we going to need that? Yeah. Are they? Yeah. 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 Yeah.